That, that was literally just a second. So Chris and I met years ago. Uh, we crash landed a plane in the Andes. And uh, um, this is a true story. Uh, and while we were stranded, we spent a couple years in the Andes. And um, uh, while we were there, we found a species of butterflies. And we spent a long time documenting the, the butterflies. And uh, when we eventually got rescued and came back here to the US, uh, Chris spent the next 10 years as a, if I get this right, a, a leptodopterist, which is a person who studies butterflies. And they got into cybersecurity. Uh, and then Chris recently decided to uh, uh, get back into cyber after uh, his, his butterfly experience. So we're glad to have him back. It's a, it's a butterflyologist. Butterflyologist. <laughs> Someone actually said it was a buttologist, but I think that's probably, no, that's probably not true. The whole thing's made up. I, it, it's a long-winded way of saying that these, these bios, you should probably read them, because I'm totally going to make shit up. So uh, Chris probably doesn't know the difference between a butterfly and a moth, just to be clear. Oh, barely. Barely. Anyway, anyway, without further ado, Chris DiLorenzo? Yep. Close enough? Close enough. I, I mispronounced a guy earlier, so now I'm really sensitive about it. Yeah. Thanks for being here, Chris. This is the part where you clap. Cheers. All right, so other than hanging out in the Andes, I also am Swedish, and I moved to the States about four years ago, and I used to work for a Swedish defense contractor doing like usability and prototyping for software for use in uh, fighter jets and some other stuff. Uh, but now I work for Dispel, trying to make um, stuff more secure and human and usable. Um, I'm, this is my first time at SmooCon, my first time presenting. Um, it's been great so far. <clears throat> so, uh, Jack, not pronounced shock, uh, is a tool that we're building to try and uh, solve the problem of uh, encrypting content in Git. And there are a lot of other solutions out there uh, for doing that. Um, but it was a problem that we, the engineers at uh, at uh, Dispel, we're kind of standing around one day, and it just makes sense to have certain files live with the rest of your code base, but you really don't want other people to have it, and that becomes an issue if it's open source, or just if you're paranoid, you don't want it to get history regardless of whether your uh, repository is private or not, frankly. And so we thought this should be solvable. So at the end of this talk, I'm going to be open sourcing Jack, and everybody can take a look at it. So first of all, what does Jack actually do? Um, obviously, it can encrypt text files, otherwise it wouldn't be much use. But other than that, we really tried hard to make it easy to use because there's this uh, misconception that developers, and not security developers, but like front-end developers, all engineers, like automatically know about cryptography and are willing to jump through an endless amounts of hoops in their workflow to keep stuff secure. And that's, you know, just frankly not true. And it turns out that to make things uh, work well in, or sorry, to encrypt files in Git, there's really only two major hurdles to jump through, and it's about maintaining state and dealing with uh, merge conflicts. Because when you have, I mean, obviously, if you're encrypting your text and it's always changing, then you're always going to be out of state, which sucks because it means you'll always be committing those same encrypted files over and over and over again. But you'll also be, uh, and also Git won't know what to do because it's basically saying, oh, this big encrypted blob changed and this other big encrypted blob changed. Uh, you know, what am I supposed to do now? And so helping people do that diff and that merge makes a lot of sense. And once you solve those two problems, you're, you're kind of semi home free. Um, but I will show you that in the demo, which I will, you know, I'm actually doing a live demo, uh, so I'd like to thank Kenny McElroy for doing one before I did, uh, being a trailblazer there. So the overall theme afterwards, or it, during this talk, is just usability in security tools, and just using Jack as kind of a, a platform for that. Uh, and obviously, since Jack encrypts files and source control, there's going to be some of that as well. So following along on our progress here, I tell you about Jack, which I just did. And now I will give you a demo. So let's see if this can work. <clears throat> so if I go to here, and hopefully you guys should see a terminal, which is absolutely huge. Let's make it a little bit smaller. What's that like? noise that's happening on the side. Yeah. 
Oh, got it. Cheers. See, solving problems together. Doesn't that feel nice? All right. So we have the tool Jack right in here. It's a command line tool. And you can see it does the stuff, right? It does encryption, decryption. It generates keys for you. It has some fancy built-ins. So let's make a new folder. And we will initialize git inside of it. So we're truly doing this from scratch. Uh, let's make a secret. Um, stick with what we're doing. And you're welcome. And also, so now we have one secret. Maybe we'll make another one. Maybe we'll put this one in a folder. Why not? Uh, I did not realize how much harder it would be to type with everybody watching me do it than just like at home. Yeah, I actually used to be a math teacher. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so now we've got our two secrets. So I can either just encrypt them without doing any setup. But Jack, the whole point is trying to make things easy. So I type Jack start to enter my nifty little setup mode here. And it says, hey, I'm creating a Jack file for you. It's going to give you some per directory settings or per Git repository settings. I'm also going to put a little key file there that has your key in it. And it's just really transparent telling you what it's doing. Another thing it's doing is it's giving me the option to add a git pre-commit hook. So if you accidentally put a file, uh, you stage a file that should really be encrypted, and it's not, it'll auto-encrypt it before you go. I wouldn't recommend uh, completely relying on that, but you know it's there as an added little safety procedure. So I definitely want that. And there we go. And so now I can check out my Jack file which has my settings in it, and it tells me, hey, here's the files that you want to encrypt commonly, but it also is used by the pre-commit hook. So we had Alice. Was Alice in the folder or was Bob in the folder? Bob. Bob's in the folder. Look at this. All right, I'm trusting you guys. Yep, all good. So now we can just do jack encrypt all. And so Alice is now encrypted. Um, so that's you know easy. I mean, anything can do encryption. Even like 7-zip and files like that can do encryption. But will this maintain state? And I certainly hope it does, but you know, demos are as demos do. So we'll decrypt just Alice, and then we'll encrypt her again. And the big thing here is that the encrypted content has not changed. So, but it will change if you change the values, obviously, because then the secret message has changed. But, um, you know, for encryption to be secure, uh, one of the things you can do is you inject a random value. And that's why before it would always change. It would always be new no matter what, even if the values hadn't changed. And so what we're doing is remembering the encrypted state behind the scenes for you and then checking that versus the same IV that we used previously. Anyway, uh, so now, Let's decrypt Alex, and let's go ahead and make the mistake of committing her, right? Uh, git add Alice, and and so we can see that Jack has injected some beautiful pink text because that's what developers love, and. Uh, let's make sure that it actually encrypted it with the very commonly used git log command looking at the history. And so we can see that what actually got committed was encrypted content as opposed to the, the secret, my dirty little secret, which was that the audience is handsome. Oh, look at that. I know, right? Um, and if we now encrypt all, It'll actually tell us, like, hey, I already encrypted Bob, but, you know, Alice is good to go. So my final thing, everybody with me so far? All good? All right. So my final one I did was a pre-baked merge conflict 
because I didn't want to like actually be committing and you know doing all this like weird stuff to make a merge conflict. So my full flict, as I call it, um, has a very standard merge conflict, right? And this is what you would expect because it's comparing two blobs from two different people's computers of encrypted content against each other. So Git freaks out, doesn't know what to do. It says, hey, you've got a conflict. So what we did was we built a tool to deal with that. Uh, and so it will, I mean, it's not really that hard. It just decrypts the two different blobs in the local and remote and then asks me which merge tool I want to use. And if I just do plain, then it's going to just put it straight in the file and just decrypt it in the file. But here I'm saying, hey, push it out into OpenDiff, which is the standard merge tool for Apple computers. And here I can decide whether the audience is pretty hot or really hot. And that is my Jack demo. So now let's get back to, to the serious business of giving presentations. And you can see my secret plan here of saying smart stuff. All right, so right after this demo, it is important for me that you know that this is not 1.0 yet, all right? This is very early stage software. Um, so me open sourcing it does not mean that you guys should go out and use it for all of your super secrets. I wanna verify it a lot more. Uh, so when, when it is 1.0 though, then you can feel pretty good that it's good to go. Uh, check the time. Oh yeah. So we did the demo and so now come a bunch of baseless ruminations and lessons learned uh, from building Jack. So the number one, or not the number one thing, but one of the things with building Jack was initially we decided to build like this mega big tool. We were gonna reinvent a new crypto, we were gonna have a UI on it, we were gonna do like team management, all this kind of stuff. And that, you know, is not necessarily a very good idea, right? It's better to just stay focused and keep to the core of the functionality that you actually need. And there's nothing that stops us from adding other VCSs uh, after the fact. I'm actually, the only reason we did Git was because we talked to a bunch of developers and that seemed to be what most people were using. So it was like a good enough market share. I actually, when I started coding, I was using Mercurial. Um, uh, also, yeah, so when building security software, I would highly recommend that you kind of almost focus more on what you're not building than what you are building to kind of keep you on that straight and narrow. And as I mentioned, we had a lot of user tests is it animating? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna let it run for like one more loop, then I'm gonna pause it. So you guys will actually listen to what I say. So this is the usability test of a glass of water. Okay, hopefully it's paused. Um, so we talked to a lot of engineers in the course of building Jack and before we even started deciding to build it. And this is what it can feel like because you're like, oh, everybody's using this wrong. And, but it's, it's better to be like a little bit humble and just kind of accept that, you know, they're having hard times with this because it's, maybe it's new to them or something like that. Um, a glass is not inherently obvious how to use perhaps. Uh, you show a glass to like, I don't know, some really old person like not living now, but like 2000 BC, and they'd be like, what transparent magic is this? Um, so, but you can learn a lot from your users, and the number one thing we wanted to learn was how are they actually solving the problem now? Like before, before, before Jack, pre-Jack. Pre um, ooh, that was not. So a lot of people were doing the, let's hope nobody is reading this strategy. They were emailing stuff around, uh, iMessaging it around, just because Apple famously didn't give up to the FBI, so clearly that is the safest way to go. Um, and you know, using private repositories, which is a really good idea, especially the private repositories one, uh, because it doesn't disrupt workflow at all. As long as you, know, you don't get into trouble, and at that point you're you know, cycling your keys, which I hope everybody here is doing, just like me. Um, some people would use the separate solution. We had people that were using like one password or last password and then managing all of their secrets in there either on a team or personal basis, which brings me to the lone wolf, which was the one person in the team, usually the CTO, that was like SSHing onto all the machines with the secrets or distributing them to their team. 
somehow like that, maintaining you know, a very high bus factor. Um, the full Monty is IT orchestration tools, which by default lead to know a lot about the different environments that you're distributing your code into. Uh, for example, so these is like Chef, Ansible, that kind of stuff. But that's you know a pretty high price to pay for some very basic security where you just want to encrypt a freaking text file and then move on with your life. Um, and then the Jack-esque type uh, solutions that were like Mozilla SOPS, which unfortunately shares that acronym with uh, special operations, which makes it kind of tricky to Google for. Um, and something I n we didn't see anybody that used, but uh, it's called Gitcrypt, which I'd recommend you check out. So another thing we learned from all of this user testing was that uh, people did not want a UI. They wanted it to be in the CLI. And you know, usually when you think, oh, let's make it more user friendly, you think, oh yeah, let's, let's have a pretty UI, we'll get a designer, it'll be pink and fluffy bunnies, big pushable buttons. But remember where your users are actually at. Our users were already building their code in the terminal, performing Git operations in the terminal, running their servers in the terminal, whatever, right? So they're already in the terminal. So to disrupt their workflow as little as possible, it actually made a lot more sense to put Jack in the terminal. And this is not what we initially thought. We went to a bunch of test users with like mock UIs being like, hey, you know, don't worry about it. This, this UI will explain everything that's happening. And, you know, if we would have given them another freaking window to have open, they would have probably come after us with like torches and pitchforks. Doesn't mean a UI is always a bad idea, mind you, but I'm, you know, definitely preaching to the crowd here, I feel like. Uh, I, oh, shit. Okay. So, how many people here know what jQuery is? Hands up. All right, so that's a pretty good haul. It's, it's a nice little JavaScript library which makes common tasks in the front end of a uh, website very easy to do. It is ubiquitous. Uh, it's very hard to find a website nowadays that doesn't load in jQuery. But it's important to note that jQuery didn't really have, it wasn't really new. Like Dojo was already on the scene. It, it's only, Remy Sharp here says, it's only really two things that made it well used. And that was it was real easy to get up and running and it had really great, easy to use documentation. Um, and depending on how much like, depending who your public is, Right? If you're going after the general public, then this is super important. If you're going after developers like jQuery, this is still pretty important. If you're forcing people to use your software in like an enterprise package or something like that, then you know, you can kind of, you know, shit on them as much as you want. But it's unfortunate nonetheless. Um, and they won't like you for it. So if you're going for being liked, you know, that's not the way to do it. Not saying Jack is jQuery, obviously, but they both start with a J, and so, you know. <laughs> Actually, the reason we chose Jack was just because it was really easy to type on a keyboard. True story. So, to recap, uh, when building software, especially security software, because I think we're a little bit maybe behind the rest of the software industry in this, it's important to just focus on the core problem, serve, solve it well, understand your users' needs, and you know, just don't force them to do a bunch of weird stuff they don't want to do, um, unless they're really into that. Uh, because if you give people the choice between easy to use software and secure software as like the main feature, unfortunately, you know, nine times out of 10, don't quote me on that, uh, they're gonna choose the easiest feature. Like I've seen way too many emails where people are sending their full financial information, social security numbers, all that kind of stuff. My previous job, I was a CTO at a startup in uh, doing uh, real estate in New York. And the, bro the emails these brokers would get, uh, oh my God. Anyway, uh, hopefully most of this talk seemed obvious to you. If it didn't, you know, well then I guess you maybe learned something. Uh, so let's make easy software that's easy to use and thank you very much. Oh. And also, and of course, I did promise, so let's go ahead and open source this bad boy. Does anybody have any questions while I'm doing this? Do you, do you plan to uh, integrate with GitLab? Um, 
it, it doesn't require anything on the other side of, uh, of Git. Like, so wherever you're hosting your repository, as long as it's Git that's interfacing with it, you should be good to go. Oh God. Uh, not currently, but that's a good feature. I'm actually, I'll write that down. Um, yeah, I haven't played around a lot with GitLab on the other side of things, so I don't know what that would require, but if you know a lot about it, definitely come talk to me. It, awesome. Anybody else? Uh, this is AES-256 encryption running in CBC mode. Okay. I feel like somebody is screaming something over there. Yeah. You probably just wanted to hear like butterfly stories. <laughs> yeah? So I generate the keys. AES stands for Advanced Encryption Standard. <laughs> How much time do I have left? Zero. So it generates the key for you. Uh, and we recommend you use this key and we force you. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Done. Did it work okay switching back and forth? Yeah, yeah, it works fine. Okay. I'm glad I'm glad we tested it for I was gonna make up I was gonna say something.